Level's good. I do too. <sighs> well, when when the speaker starts standing still and takes deep breaths and starts pulling on their hair, it's time to begin. I first got to thank uh, Todd. He asked me, would you do something here and did a great help, and that's because of Todd that we're here today. Uh, and also for you. Just so you know, I'm going to speak kind of straight away within a pre-recorded, timed framework of in and out music and F FX and all of that, which means if you say, can I ask you something? It's going to be hard. <laughs> later, later. <laughs> also, um, now you're all really puzzled at this. Yeah, yeah, I heard that. <laughs> this is really the visual uh, uh, analogy, analog of what we're going to do today. And I'm going to take just a second to go, you know, down through. Not too long, but you're going to know when we're hitting that, that topic, okay? This is about 55 minutes. If you feel, if you're getting a call from a cell phone or the restroom, you're fine. Just go quietly and come back and, you know, join us. Let's begin. The first few don't involve people. The first few are about the land. This is Jefferson County. The yellow is indicating that we were in a very, an area with a lot of limestone, which will become important later. This is a painting of Harper's Ferry in 1830. If you're on the Virginia side, you know, and driving by, and you look to the right, you're going to see that image. And, and what it's showing is the violent uh, nature of, there was very violent collisions between two uh, uh, continents causing violent upheavals of the land. And that's a very good example of that. The Ice Age, this is, just remember, a mile high glacier, right? Got about as far as uh, the Susquehanna. We touch on that. That is Cornstalk, the Shawnee chief from around the 1700s in this area. And behind it is a place which was, I'll explain it, but it was a sacred uh, feasting area where tribes came together to rekindle their tribes. The ship is us Euro Europeans. <laughs> this is us coming. Uh, and this describes the emigration from Europe to America. This guy, that's an early version of George Washington. Oh, well, the, yeah, it's a, a modeling that did, they're doing at Mount Vernon. And let's just say that covers a lot of ground. We the people, oh, an extraordinary story of how 15 West Virginians within our, our boundaries today really saved the Constitution, really. James Rumsey, you know who he is, I hope. Reason Davis Shepard, great story there. Arguably, you know, if you had to pick somebody, probably the most successful business person to be born here. Down here is R.J. Funkhauser. He was, he's in competition, but he was actually born uh, in, in uh, Big Pool, Maryland. That's not a man. <laughs> That's a John H. Hall's breech-loading rifle, and that symbolizes the most extraordinary world-changing event that happened in Jefferson County. World-changing. Martin Delaney. Incredible life. Never heard of him. That seems to be a story here. We'll hit on that. If you look at his accomplishments, regardless of color, he might have been the most accomplished person born in Jefferson County. This is right across from Trinity Episcopal Church around 17, I mean, excuse me, 1855, and that is Benjamin Franklin Harrison. This is the, uh, on the corner of Church and German, and that is Mamie. I know because that's what it said below the daguerreotype. I believe that's the earliest known photograph of an African-American in Jefferson County. And there's a girl about her age in the 18th census with a big E next to it. 
which means escaped. John Pendleton Kennedy, he wrote a, a book called Swallow Barn, which is hugely influential. And then this tradition of plantation literature morphed into something we have known as Gone with the Wind. You know, you know John Brown, a few comments on that. I tended to be hit a few points, but not go deep on the Civil War. Do I hear any sighs? Okay. <laughs> Logan Osborne, a key person uh, who had to make that decision whether he su supported his state or the nation, a, you know, a Hamlet figure. Henrietta Bedinger Lee, all I can tell you is don't mess with her. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a great story, but something happened to her, which after this, that, this, that, and the other thing, altered the outcome of the Civil War. And you'll, you can ju judge for yourself. But one, you know how it is one thing leads to another? And when Jewel Early burns Chambersburg to the ground because of what happened to your house, that starts altering the complexion of the war. John Trowbridge is not born here, but he was able to be in Charlestown in the summer of 65, and he soaks up that mood. Apples were the salvation after the war. All those horses and wagons compacted that soil for wheat, so it was unusable for wheat, hence apple trees. My one of my favorite, Dansky Dandridge, some of you know about her, it's a fabulous writer. It's impossible not to like her. You know who this guy is? Well, this is, this is one of my favorites. He came to Charlestown because one of his closest buddies from, from a, uh, Princeton, John Peel Bishop, uh, he stayed with him for a month. And we are so fortunate that the woman who was with him every day was able to put it in, into words. And she didn't pull some of her punches. That's Lauren Hillenbrand, Seabiscuit. It was a horse at Charlestown where she, that made her fall in love with horse racing. And behind her image are about six surprising and fascinating facts about people related to the racetrack. Right, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. RJ, if that's not Beetle Brow, you know. Doesn't it look a little, if you know Randy Funkhauser, can you see a little bit of Randy, but Randy's a little nicer. <laughs> and I won't say any more, but I thought uh, Clay Lashley said to me, where's Frank Buckles? <laughs> so I put in Frank Buckles and his wonderful daughter, Susanna. we have done without the mutual mystical bond that held the general with his ragged volunteers. Many a heart will break into awe Should he ne'er come back again Will ye no come back again Will ye no come back again Better loved ye cannot be. Will ye no come back again?
redoing the nation to last had its seed in a chat in an inn in September 1784 in today's Berkeley Springs, then called Warm Springs, Virginia. But it was in disguise. The war finally over, and with peace gently reclaiming daily life, George Washington's providential schmoozing in September 1784 with an innkeeper in Berkeley Springs named James Rumsey. Washington went down to the river, saw Rumsey's upstream paddle boat work. He was completely satisfied with the boat and the ingenious Mr. Rumsey immediately seeing how this could make possible his dream. He thought, there must be a way to unite my two worlds, the coastal port seamen and lenders with the woodsmen and farmers on the frontier, and all of this by way of rivers and canals that we will build. Rumsey, as Washington's choice to be the Potomac Company's supervisor and chief engineer charged with blasting through rock on the Potomac, endured a year of minuscule pay and monstrous undoability and quit. But the Potomac Company, in a sense, succeeded vastly by failing, showing unequivocally once and for all that only interstate teamwork fed by federal funds, could get big road and canal projects done. Now Rumsey and Washington knew the law of the land. The Articles of Confederation was a bigger obstacle than any boulder in the Potomac to interstate river travel because it forbade a strong central government that could plan, fund, and execute it more properly than a gaggle of dithering states. Ron Chernow, recipient of the Pulitzer Prize for his biography of George Washington, wrote, The plan to extend navigation of the Potomac influenced American history in ways that far transcended the narrow matter of commercial navigation. It created a set of practical problems that could be saved only by cooperation between Virginia and Maryland, setting a pattern for a seminal interstate conference at Annapolis in September 1786 and indeed, the Constitutional Convention itself in 1787. Possessed by the need to reform, Washington kept driving home his idea of uniting frontier and shore with first one meeting of a few people at Mount Vernon in the spring of 1785, carrying over to another meeting, same issues and more at a bigger stage and more actors in Annapolis, Maryland in September 1786, morphing again into the mother of all meetings with all the actors on the largest stage of all, the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787 to rewrite the worthless Articles of Confederation. At Mount Vernon in 1785, they took a baby step and showed Virginia and Maryland could create a framework for profitably sharing their rights to their common waterways, the Potomac and Chesapeake. More talk at Annapolis on easier trade between citizens of different states, but turnout was low. So, on May 24, 1787, the eve of the Constitutional Convention at Independence Hall in Philadelphia, 
call it make or break time, there starkly stood need for a central government that could forcibly tax the people to retire a huge war debt, a need to regulate all interstate commerce, a need to be one voice before all the world for all times in regulating foreign trade, and a need to kill off the one rule that all 13 states needed by law to explicitly okay any new power to the already hobbled central government, even any amendment to the Articles. The Articles were not a road to the future, they were a tomb. Fifty-five delegates from all but one state poured into town. It began with some quick sleight of hand by Pennsylvania's early arriving delegates that transformed the whole affair to be not just a tinkering of the articles as planned, but an expedition to blow them up and start over with something new. Government must possess the sense of the people. <clears throat> the only remedy is to enlarge the sphere. My state, New Jersey, would be swallowed up. You, Madison, do you see the consequences of pushing things too far? Hamilton, the gentleman, is praised by all, but supported by no gentleman. <sighs> it is a work of great delicacy and impeded by jealousies. You, Martin, have exhausted the politeness of this convention. If you possess the power, you will not be checked. Both sides must part with some of their demands. As of this July 2nd, so many things have been so well settled. A foreign sword will do the work for us if we don't agree. July 10th. The councils are in a worse train than ever. The three-fifths concession on July 11th proved to be the greatest concession to the South. I arrived on July 23rd and voted with the bigger states. Are they men? Then make them citizens and let them vote. Religion and humanity have nothing to do with slavery.
it is best to leave the matter of slavery where we find it. The general government should have the power to prevent the increase of slavery. Slavery in time will not be a speck. In all ages, one half of mankind have been slaves. Every article is again argued with much obstinacy. The energy of law is to operate only on individuals. The southern states now are well secured. The cornerstone of republicanism is justice and honor. I have found them, the delegates from Massachusetts and Connecticut, liberal and candid. The South has the most reason to dread disunion. Pierce Butler moves for a fugitive slave law and it passes. That glorious day when the Constitution's skirt was decorated with the blood oath signatures of the yes men, but for three. Our county's history has made some big contributions to our country's history. This is special to a nation's fortunes, and this is one. Listen in. The proposed United States Constitution is passed by a vote in Philadelphia in September 1787, pending the approval of at least nine states in their own ratifying conventions. If Virginia, which included us here in being a state with one-fifth of all the potential nation's populations were to vote no, what might have happened? We would have been descended into an enfeebled anarchy and be exploited by powerful countries with vast holdings immediately to our west. didn't look good because George Mason of Virginia, a delegate to be at the Virginia Convention, humiliated Washington at the convention the year before and left, refusing to sign the final product. Mason had stormed out of the Philadelphia meeting the previous summer, refusing to sign the result because of a 9-0 and 1 abstention vote blocked his last-minute motion to start a new committee to explore a Bill of Rights. All of the delegates were exhausted and had been trickling homeward already. 
Governor Morris, along with James Wilson from Pennsylvania, wrote the final version of the Constitution, and he was also a close friend of General Washington. He turned to Mason and said, sarcastically, what a marvelous idea. We've been talking about that for weeks. But when Mason, while debating a measure to check the power of an American president, devilishly crowed before Washington, this convention is about to try an experiment on which the most despotic governments have never ventured. The Grand Signor himself has his divan. Washington, from that day forth until Mason died, called this old wrecking ball of a man my quondam friend. But what did not fade away was a stream of vilely worded handbills about the delegates of the Constitutional Convention going back to George Mason. With the Virginia Convention approaching, Washington's private secretary, Tobias Lear, wrote John Langdon, Mr. Mason and Mr. Henry still continue opposition with unabated violence. The opponents here have changed their mode of attack. They are now endeavoring to deprecate the characters which compose the General Convention even Colonel Mason has descended to this low method and has declared that the convention, generally speaking, was made of blockheads from the northern, coxcombs from the southern, and office seekers from the middle states. now June 1788 of Virginia's 168 delegates who met at their convention in Richmond. 16 of them were from the part that is today West Virginia. Our guy, Adam Stephen, who owned land in both today's Berkeley and Jefferson County, who for many years was Washington's executive officer and later a general in the Revolution, was their spokesman and leader, writes Cook in this small space. Stephen's life can scarcely be touched upon, and in the story of this Constitutional Convention, he stands forth as the leader of the Western delegates. On one side of the contest was the soft-spoken, walking encyclopedia James Madison, who was hard to hear, facing the two bombasts, George Mason and Patrick Henry. The Federal Convention ought to have amended the old system. For this purpose they were solely delegated. The object of the mission extended to no other consideration. The distinction between a national government and a confederacy is not sufficiently discerned. Had the delegates who were sent to Philadelphia power to propose a consolidated government instead of a confederacy? Here is a resolution as radical as that which separated us from Great Britain. It is radical in its transition. Our rights and privileges are endangered and the sovereignty of the state will be relinquished, and cannot we plainly see that this is actually the case? The rights of conscience, trial by jury, liberty of the press, all your immunities and franchises, all pretensions to human rights and privileges are rendered insecure, if not lost by this change, so loudly talked of by some so inconsiderately by others. A number of characters of the greatest eminence in this country object to this government for its consolidating tendency, 
This is not imaginary. It is a formidable reality. If consolidation proves to be as mischievous to this country as it has been to other countries, what will the poor inhabitants of this country do? This government will operate like an ambuscade. It'll destroy the state governments and swallow the liberties of the people without given previous notice. If gentlemen are willing to run the hazard, let them run it. But I shall exculpate myself by my opposition and monetary warnings within these walls. At one point, Henry goaded the ever-silent western men from over the mountains, and Stephen was silent no more. Henry means to frighten us by his bugbears of hobgoblins, his sale of lands to pay taxes, Indian purchases, and other horrors that I think I know as much about as he does. He continued for a while. If the gentleman does not like this government, let him go and live among the Indians. I know of several nations that live very happily, and I can furnish him a vocabulary of their language. In three weeks, the debates raged. Patrick Henry hogging vast hours and sessions with rhetoric that was generally free of earthbound factuality, but accurately nailing the Constitution for its complete transference to the federal court, the final review of all cases, quote, under the Constitution, end quote. And the tough question remained. Do we ratify first with the express intention of creating the Bill of Rights next, or not ratify the Constitution until the Bill of Rights is all finished? The second alternative was a trap, because each state could have its own ideas of the Bill of Rights. And for Patrick Henry, just about every comma in the Constitution was a conspiratorial dagger. At the Revolution, it must be admitted that it was in their sense to set down these great rights which ought in all countries to be held inviolable and sacred. She is called upon now to abandon them and dissolve that compact which secured them to her. Will she do it? This is the question. If you intend to reserve your unalienable rights, you must have the most express stipulation. For if implication be allowed, you are ousted of those rights. If the people do not think it necessary to reserve them, they will be supposed to be given up. If you give up these powers without a Bill of Rights, you will exhibit the most absurd thing to mankind that ever the world saw. A government that has abandoned all the powers, the powers of direct taxation, the sword, and the purse. You have disposed of those to Congress without a Bill of Rights, without check, without limitation, or control. You still have checks and guards. Still you keep barriers. Pointed where? Pointed against your weakened, prostrated, innovated state government. Is it not a conduct of unexampled absurdity? It's coming down to the wire and a final vote. Patrick Henry is volcanically railing for hours and even days against ratification, and up jumps Stephen. I was sent hither to adopt the Constitution as it is, but such is my regard for my fellow citizens that I would concur in amendment. The gentlemen on the other side have adduced to reasons or proofs to convince us that the amendments would become a part of the system before ratification. What reason have we to suspect that persons who are chosen from among ourselves will not agree to the introduction of such amendments as will be desired by the people at large? In all safe and free governments, there ought to be a judicious mixture of three kinds. But the democratic kind preponderates as it ought to do. The members of one branch are immediately chosen by the people, and the people also elect, in a secondary degree, the members of the other two. At present we have no confederate government, 
It exists but in name. The honorable gentleman asked, Where is the genius of America? What else but that genius has stimulated the people to reform that government, which woeful experience has proven to be totally inefficient? What has produced the unison of sentiments in the states on this subject? I expected that filial duty and affection would have impelled him to inquire for the genius of Virginia. That genius which formerly resisted British tyranny and in the language of manly intrepidity and fortitude said to that nation, Thus far and no further shall ye proceed. What has become of that genius which spoke that magnanimous language? that genius that produced the Federal Convention. Yonder she is in mournful attire, her hair dishevelled, distressed in grief and sorrow, supplicating our assistance against gorgons, fiends, and hydras which are ready to devour her and carry dissolution throughout her country. She bewails the decay of trade and neglect of agriculture. Her farmers discouraged, her ship carpenters, blacksmiths, and all other tradesmen unemployed. She casts her eyes on these and deplores her inability to relieve them. She sees her eyes on these, and the profits of her commerce goes to foreign states. She further bewails that all she can raise by taxation is inadequate to her necessities. She sees religion die by her side, public faith prostituted, and private confidence lost between man and man. Are the hearts of her citizens so deaf to compassion that they will not go to her relief? Expostulations must be made for the defection of Virginia when Congress meets. They will inquire where she has lately discovered so much wisdom, she that gave us an immense tract, northwest country, to relieve the general distresses wherein constitutes the superiority to her friends of South Carolina and the respectable state of Massachusetts, who, to prevent a dissolution of the Confederacy, adopted the Constitution and proposed such amendments as they thought necessary placing confidence in the other states that they would accede them. We are about to determine whether we should be one of the United States or not. On June 25th, a Wednesday, the final vote, 89 yes, 79 no, don't ratify. Of the 16 votes from today's West Virginia, who Stephen spoke repeatedly and passionately for, 15 were I. One was nay. Virginia became part of the United States and the nation was truly born, crucially because of Adam Stephen and 15 of our West Virginia brethren. Pretty nice. Pumped up, are you all pumped up now? I love it. A marker marks where Adam Stephen is buried today in his town where he died July 16, 1791. What has become of that genius which spoke that magnanimous language? That genius 
that produced the Federal Convention. She sees religion die by her side, public faith prostituted, and private confidence lost between man and man. Are the hearts of her citizens so deaf to compassion that they will not go to her relief? And we'll all go together. We are about to determine whether we should be one of the United States or not. All around the globe. 